Aristotle stated that imitation is an innate human behavior. As children, we play pretend. It's in our human nature to copy things. A performance, if you may. So where does the art of performance originate from? The first officially recorded theatrical performance occurred around 600 BC. A priest of the cult of Dionysus named Thespis stepped out in front of a crowd and bantered back to the audience while they performed a chant called a dithyram, which was a religious song at the time. People were so inspired by Thespis's display that they began calling anyone who performed in front of a crowd a thespian, not to be confused with lesbian. Now you may have already known that fact about Thespis, but did you know that what we could look at today and clock as drag actually predates Thespis and his whole theater gig and the entire cult of Dionysus? The phenomenon of cross-dressing as a public performance can be traced back to ancient artifacts throughout several parts of the world as far back as 2000 BC. That's, That's 2,600 years, years before, before Thespis. Thespis. Archaeologists have uncovered pottery, books, and paintings from the Greek cult of Aphroditus. These artifacts show or describe people painting their faces, constructing masks, and displaying gender-defying or androgynous personas, including women in false beards. Aphroditus was a transgender god, and their identity in history is where the term hermaphrodite is derived from. This outdated term is now understood to mean intersex, or a human who displays both masculine and feminine qualities. In the time of Aphroditus, the act of cross-dressing was a religious attempt at a greater understanding of divinity by breaking down the human experience of sex and gender. And I'm sure if you ask around, breaking down the human experience is very similar to how drag is described by modern performers today. As a basic concept, drag or gender performance has had several names and been present in many cultures for thousands and thousands of years. People have embraced it for countless reasons, anything from praising a deity to challenging oppression to celebrating joy. I'm adorable, and I'm a drag queen, an educator, and a content creator on various platforms and screen portals just like this one. I call myself queer and non-binary, but you can call me whatever you want as long as you mean it with love. I want to share with you some fun facts I've learned, and I want to talk about some lesser known historical roots of drag through the eyes of women, AFAB people, people of color, and other marginalized groups, some queer and some not. We will follow the concept of gender performance through time to see how pottery from 2000 BC plants the seeds that shapes the drag industry into what it is that we see today. I will be including references and sources in the description below for where I found all the information that I'm going to be covering. I encourage you to do more research on these topics and learn more. Between 800 to 1000 AD, these Christian guys decided they didn't like anybody finding divinity in anything but their God. So they burned a lot of opposing religious and historical texts and killed a lot of people whose identities they deemed unholy, incorrect, or queer. This included the aforementioned pagan cults. This heinous act was given a palatable name for history, the Crusades. So, while Christians were being pretty awful over in Europe, in Asia, both men and women were partaking in cross-dressing to entertain royal courts. Female artists in the ancient traditional Chinese theater commonly portrayed soldiers and trained in real fighting techniques. Enter Ping Yang Ye a well-known figure in the ancient Chinese theater. To better portray her roles, she tattooed complex patterns on her arms and legs. Because of their tenacity and their achievements on stage, these women were sometimes allowed to get an education. However, as Buddhism and Christianity spread throughout the world, there was a heavy patriarchal effort to keep women out of the theater. Female bodies performing in public were seen as offensive, provocative, and inappropriate on societal and religious grounds. Even though women weren't allowed to perform, some still were. In direct opposition to the reverent religious art forms of the time, Azumo no Akuni formed the Kabuki Theater, 
Performing and traveling with an all-female troupe, they would paint their faces and perform in exaggerated versions of femininity. This was said to be an act of defiance on the bans and constrictions on female bodies and women's bodies at the time. Except the patriarchy didn't let this last long, and in 1629, the Japanese government officially banned women from performing in any sort of public theater. Unfortunately, this legislated patriarchal male-only theater concept was not not specific to any region. In Shakespearean theater, male actors would play every part on stage because women were not permitted to be in the theater. However, into the 1700s, as there was a push for more dynamics and realism on stage, in addition to accessing feminine roles, women were allowed to cross-dress in some roles. Terms like breeches roles popped up. Breeches refers to the pants that women would wear to play a man or a young boy. To this day, women still portray these breeches roles in modern theater and opera. Throughout the 1700s, there was a chain reaction in the creation of new performance styles, all inspired by each other and a lot of which including elements of cross-dressing. The art of pantomime, or panto, was developed around 1721. In early pantomime, there were common tropes that saw male actors portraying stereotypes of older, promiscuous women. Their roles were depicted as villainous characters. Female actors played young, masculine protagonists ultimately being the targets of their sexual desires. But nowadays, pantomime has been sanitized through history, gearing towards a more family-friendly vibe. Inspired by pantomime events, we see a new form of entertainment structure popping up in America. It's vaudeville, baby! Vaudeville was a variety show that featured all different types of entertainment, pretty much whatever was in town. Singers, actors, contortionists, comedians, and acts with cross-dressing. At the time, these acts were billed as comedic or even wholesome, which some were, but just as many were not. Racism, sexism, and ableism, etc., were deeply saturated in the culture and the arts of 1800s America. A lot of popular entertainment was aimed at the expense of minorities, as vaudeville commonly featured various forms of minstrelsy. In 1842, Lucy Long was the most popular minstrelsy song. During the performance, the character Lucy, commonly portrayed by a white man, would walk around the audience, seducing everybody in a mockingly degrading manner. From pantomime to vaudeville, and explicitly in these cases of minstrelsy, the act of cross-dressing has been used as a tool of the patriarchy and white supremacy to make fun of and put down women and their sexuality, especially black women and other minorities, for entertainment. We must be informed on the full historical and cultural impacts of the art form that we are either a part of or appreciate in order to move forward in a way that is respectful. It is extremely important to acknowledge that this history is not a reflection of our current drag and queer culture. In these early days of the stage, the act of cross-dressing wasn't inherently associated with queerness. They were not performing for themselves. They were not exploring a personal gender expression. They represent the opposite of unguarded exploration, which is what the art form of drag stands for. Some of the first performers to utilize cross-dressing in its own art form for this unguarded exploration of gender and sexuality were actually cis women. In the 1800s America and the United Kingdom, there were artists such as Ella Wessner, Vesta Tilly, Florence Hines, Hetty King, Ella Shields, and Annie Hindel as gender-bending performers. They would sing and dance in nightclubs, dressed in dapper suits, swooning audiences all over the world. In 1930, a black woman and lesbian named Gladys Bentley famously performed in Harlem's Ubangi Club, backed up by a chorus line of drag queens. Their celebrity brought huge representation to queer people at the time. Some identified as gay or queer, and Annie Hindel made headlines when she married a woman. These incredible individuals helped shape gender performance for the remainder of the century. So 
when did the term drag first come about anyway? One thing that we know for sure is that the term drag came from 1700s British slang. With that being the most definitive fact, we may never actually know what it really truly meant. But historians have their speculation. Some believe that Shakespeare used this as stage directions when writing his plays, drag being an acronym for dressed resembling a girl. But it is actually historically unlikely, seeing as acronyms were not invented until World War II, and the term acronym wasn't even coined and put in the dictionary until 1943. Some say the term drag is based off of the term grand rag, which was used to describe an elaborate masquerade ball where people would wear fancy gowns and capes that would drag on the ground. Getting in drags could have simply meant getting extra. Ultimately, we don't know if it was gender or performance performance specific for that time period, but what we do know is what it means to the drag and the queer community to this day. The first time we see drag queen used in a queer performative sense was by William Dorsey Swan. Swan was a gay black man and a former slave who created events for his community in the 1800s. Other gay black men would risk their lives to attend his parties because they were considered illegal. Swan's extravagant parties were hailed as the first drag balls, where he donned the title Queen of Drag. These balls continued into the 1900s, into the 80s, into the 90s. It is at these drag balls that modern queer culture was truly molded into what it is today. The lingo, the structure of drag families, the dance style of voguing, and so many other attributes of the queer community can be traced back to these balls and to the black trans queer community. The documentary Paris is Burning provides an excellent snapshot during the height of the 80s drag ball culture. Drag shows and queer gatherings have been a continuous target to this day of legislation and violence against our community. On June 28th, 1969, New York City police raided a drag show at the Stonewall Inn. As the police were arresting citizens, Miss Marsha P. Johnson threw the first brick. It is famously reported that Stormy DeLarvery threw the first punch at an officer. The commemoration of this event is what went on to spark yearly traditional pride gatherings all over the world, where you guessed it, we hold drag shows and other various events hosted by drag artists. Drag in itself is activism, as it is seen as inherently political, especially today. And because of this, drag artists have used this spotlight to spearhead projects, charities, and organizations to promote awareness for queer issues. Drag artists are political figures and influencers. People in drag are often the first face that many outside of the community see. And this is why drag artists have always played a huge role in the front lines of activism and public relations. Modern drag performers take inspiration from all of our fragmented history. Kabuki, Shakespearean theater, pantomime, vaudeville, drag balls, and their own personal experiences and cultural experiences. The concept of drag and gender performance is literally ancient, and the art form will always be a tool for people to express themselves no matter what body they were born in. And with that, drag artistry itself has become a part of history and humanity. Drag is for humans to express our glittery souls and thrive out of societal boxes. Drag is a form of protesting the anti-queerness of society. Drag is education. Drag is giving people the tools they need to express themselves and learn to love themselves more. Drag is freedom. Drag is creation. Drag is joy. Drag is all of these things and so much more. I've been adorable. This has been a little bit of drag history and I'll see you next time.